This is Freedom Investor Radio, and I'm John Pearl. It hit me like a freight train when I realized there was a better way. When I discovered that I could take my future into my own hands. When I realized I could invest my way to freedom. This is what I'm working towards. In each episode of Freedom Investor Radio, we will explore the tactics and strategies used by the top real estate investors and entrepreneurs in the nation. We will learn how you can start investing your way to freedom and take control of your life. Thanks so much for tuning in. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Investor Radio. I'm your host, John Pearl, and today I am joined by Rob Beardsley, who is a principal at Lone Star Capital. Rob, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Rob, I'm just going to go ahead and pass it over for those that may not know who you are. Give us a high level background of what you're, tell us what you're doing now, where you're at, what Lone Star Capital is doing, and give us the high level of how you got there. So my business partner and I, we founded Lone Star Capital nearly five years ago to focus on owning and operating Texas workforce housing. To date, we've acquired over $350 million in assets, all being Texas value-add properties. And a little over a year ago, we launched our own property management company. So we vertically integrated with operations based out of Houston. We're here, the corporate team's based in New York. And we also most recently begun the process for bringing construction in-house as well. So we're trying to vertically integrate across the the business and stay focused in our target markets in Texas. Prior to forming Lone Star, I was in college studying computer science. I grew up in the Bay Area in a real estate family. My parents ran a residential brokerage firm from home, but everything they did was on the single family side of things, whether it be fix and flips, development, construction, and of course, brokerage. So the single family side didn't really resonate with me. So it wasn't until college where I discovered multifamily and really felt that the business model, more of a long-term mindset, more of a scalable business really resonated with me. And that's when I met my business partner and we got together and formed Lone Star. Got it. That's excellent. So yeah, you got your start at a pretty young age comparatively to a lot of people in the space. Now, what was the process like in your mind, jumping from you're in college Am I going to take the typical route, go get a job, work for somebody else? Or am I going to go out and create something on my own or with a partner? And what was your process like for that? And talk us through some of the things that you were going through. I always had an entrepreneurial mind. So it wasn't a big leap. A part of me thought that I was going to get involved in some sort of tech startup after school, given that I grew up in Silicon Valley and my parents were pushing me in that direction saying, oh, you don't want to do this boring real estate stuff. The tech world is where all the big money is and they're not wrong, but yeah. So for me, it wasn't a big leap to do something entrepreneurial in the real estate space. And for me, it was very pragmatic. What Basically, I didn't have a master plan or this big vision. I just started doing and started with, okay, I want to look at multifamily deals. All right, let's just start looking at multifamily deals and start underwriting and talking to people, networking as much as possible, going to different events, meetups, having meetings, lenders, investors, brokers. So just getting involved in the business to the point where it was consuming all my time. And then from there, it just became a simple situation of I'm spending all my time on this. I need to go all in and drop out of school and go for it. And if it doesn't work out, I can go right back to school. If it does work out, great. I'll learn a ton of lessons either way and and be much better for it. So I did it wasn't really emotional or like this big passion it was just putting one foot in front of the other. That's great. So how did you meet your partner and kind of talk about the early stages of working with your partner forming Lone Star? Do we just do this on a deal by deal basis? It's a big commitment forming a partnership and committing getting married in business. And so talk about what your roles were early on, how you guys formed up, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it is a big commitment for sure. And we were very fortunate to just have a very good natural click. So we met through a mentorship group and we actually met at a conference originally. And then from there, we stayed in touch via phone and email pretty much every day, just started looking at deals together. And like you're saying, you can work deal by deal 
initially. You don't have to get married before you date. In real estate, you can date, you can do a deal, and then you can say, oh, this deal went well, we can do more. Or if it doesn't go that great, you don't have to ever do a deal again together. So for us, we again, same thing. We didn't have a master plan of, hey, let's form a partnership and let's take over the world together. It was just, hey, we're both busy. Maybe if we work together, we can accomplish more. And let's look at deals together. Let's just try to grow together. And so that's what we did. We just originally were had just like a advisory relationship where we just help each other out. And then once we actually put a deal under contract together, then it made things real. And it's clear that, hey, it's probably in our best interest to just go all in on this partnership now. It's worked so far and, and let's keep it going. And I think even as quickly as it went for us, I think that's not the right way to go. It was, it's very risky, like you're saying about a partnership. I think we just got very lucky that we work really well together and have complementary skill sets. But I think generally speaking, you want to really take your time as far as these partnerships go. I see a lot of people, they get excited. They listen to a podcast like this and they want to do something and they want to do it now. But and, and in that moment, when you have all this passion and excitement, it's really hard to be patient, but patience really does pay off. Yeah, totally. So how about the, you guys have experienced a lot of growth over the past few years and I know you just moved into a new office. So talk about the process of growing and building a company and bringing on employees and what that's been like for you guys and the decision to actually get an office. I know a lot of people, just partners, they are in business together. They work from home. They do the Zoom calls. What was the decision-making process like to get an actual in-person office, a headquarters? And just talk us through that a little bit. Growing the business is one of my favorite parts of the business. I really do enjoy thinking about the org chart and thinking about hiring and where people belong and how to organize everything and different processes and stuff like that. So I really do enjoy that. And you can't really scale without people and process people and systems. So I do spend a lot of time thinking about that. And so we've scaled, I'd say on the people side, very slowly. There's, there's six of us here in the office. We have one remote and then we've got six people on the management and construction side in Texas. And in terms of getting an office, we always felt like it was a necessity. We always felt like we were missing something and we were just waiting to get to enough scale and get to the right time. So we we never really, we did all the Zoom stuff and the remote stuff, especially during COVID and all that when we were getting started, but we never felt that was adequate. And I still am a believer in the office. Like you're alluding to today, there's a lot of discussion about, okay, do you really need an office, Zoom and work from home and remote, all the great things about that, but we really are not believers in it. We think being in the office has so many benefits that we're just being in the office. We've worked in person together, the major, the core team for years, but, but just actually being in an office every day is different. We're already noticing the benefits. Being able to walk down the hall and answer a question really quickly or ask a question, it just is so much faster and better. And then as far as culture goes, these days, some people are getting hired onto a new job and then leaving that job, never having met any of those individuals in person. How do you build culture in that way? You know, people, it's just the accountability is different. The culture is different. I think it really is, is a no brainer as an employer. On the employee side, it's very interesting because you can understand why a lot of people are demanding remote work. Because you sit at home and don't work if you're an employee who's not passionate about the business. So if you do have really high quality people that are passionate about the business, then remote does work. But if you're trying to get together a workforce that is not, and I'm not trying, not saying our workforce isn't passionate, but I'm just kind of speaking broadly about the market. I understand why JP Morgan, et cetera, want their people in. Yeah, Totally. I can relate with the uh, the comments on the working from home and not being passionate. I'm going through some growth myself with our business and trying to bring on a couple employees. And yeah, it's tough to find people who are as passionate as you. I think it's probably never going to happen. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the types of deals you guys are looking for. I know you believe strongly in the importance of niching down on what you're looking for. So tell us about the deals that you do like, why you like them, and also how important vertical integration has been in that. Yeah, absolutely. So I do believe strongly in niching down and being an expert, whether it be in a geography or an asset class or a strategy. And the more you branch out, the more you dilute your 
focus and skill set. And I think focus really creates a ton of value. So for us, we're focused on Texas workforce housing and more, more specifically just Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston. So just those two major markets. And then we're looking for typically 80s to 2000s vintage assets that have a value add component, which doesn't narrow it down a ton, but it it still keeps us focused enough to where we can create differentiated value through our focus, through better deal flow. And then on the vertically integrated side of things, as far as management, we can create value through our operations. And what I mean by that is if you own a property in Kansas City, San Diego, and Denver, it's going to be nearly impossible to run those vertically integrated, which means you actually run the property management yourself because that would require your employees being on planes all the time. And that's not time efficient and nor money efficient. So if you have a portfolio that's all within an hour, if all the properties are within an hour of each other, then you can absolutely get economies of scale and manage the portfolio in-house. So that's one of the reasons why we have stayed so focused in the markets that we're in. And how does vertical integration, having your own property management company in the big picture, how does the benefits of that carry over down to the to, to getting better returns and down to the investors in these deals? Yeah, big thing is transparency. If you have a management company, I would say that the bad news travels a little bit slower. So transparency, we see everything, we know everything. Hopefully the bad news travels faster so that we can make implement it. We can fix problems quicker. That's really important. And then being nimble, where if you have more layers, bureaucracy, essentially, or multiple lines of communication where your asset manager has to talk to their asset manager or their regional manager or the, their vice president down to their regional, and then finally making th something happen at the property is, it's just more bureaucracy. And you're, you end up being less nimble if you want to quickly pivot. For example, during COVID, if you want to quickly pivot to time tours, in light of all the COVID stuff that was happening a couple of years ago at this point, that would take longer if you weren't vertically integrated and you could just pick up the phone and get right to your people. So that's just being nimble is important. And then I think the really big one is, is control. Because if you have a third-party management firm, their goal is to scale to as many properties as possible without being fired, rather than trying to deliver the absolute best service to each individual property. It's more so a function of, okay, how thin can we spread our regional managers? Can we spread them across five properties, 10 properties, 12 properties? So we have double the amount of regional managers per property than the industry standard. And that causes our property management firm to run at a loss or a break even. But of course, that's we're thinking about the bigger picture. And we know that if we operate the properties better, we will make way more money in our promotes and growing our business rather than trying to make a little profit at the management company level. Got it. So Rob, you've become quite the author. Now I have in front of me two books that you've written. The first one you wrote a couple of years ago, The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. And then more recently, you came out with Structuring and Raising Debt and Equity for Real Estate. And so talk to us a little bit about the process. So I I don't know too many people that would uh, just decide to, they're learning something, they decide to write a book about it, they get the experience. But what was your, at what point did you decide that it, that, hey, I'm just going to write a book about this? Talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, the first book, I don't remember exactly when I decided, but it was fairly early on, actually, I, because I was frustrated when I was first learning the business myself. I was frustrated that there wasn't such a resource, a straightforward guide that would just give me a step by step instruction on how to underwrite. And so I told myself, okay, I'm going to learn this, figure it out, and then I'll write the book. There's clearly a big gap in the market for this. But it wasn't until years later until I actually wrote the book. And I started writing it a little bit before COVID. And then there were the lockdown, sitting at home, and I just cranked out the book from there. And that, that kind of gave me that extra push to just write like a madman. So I was able to write the book really quickly. And it was really easy to write because I just pulled out my underwriting spreadsheet and just went through input by input, line by line, and just wrote down everything that came to mind when I thought about other income, rubs, expenses, rent growth, debt assumptions, all that stuff. So I just went through every single line. So it, it literally is like a step-by-step -step tutorial. So that was that was the impetus for the first book was just simply, hey, there's this thing missing in the market that I think people would really get a lot of value out of. 
obviously not everybody in the world is interested in reading a really boring book about multifamily underwriting that's analytical in the weeds. But for those people that are interested in that topic, it has been a huge, huge success, niche success for that topic. And then the second book, it was once I wrote the first one, I felt this pressure to write more. And I, for some reason, I just really am passionate about capital structure and debt and equity and putting deals together. I like the creativity and the nuance of thinking about different deal structures and different asset classes or different strategies, matching different investment goals, as well as different parts of the cycle and things like that. For me, it was uh, is a book that I wanted to write as well, but it didn't have the same kind of like filling the niche gap. Not to say that there's a bunch of books already out on the topic, but it was more so something that I wanted to write about rather than a gap in the market I thought I would fill. Got it. So yeah, I, I can say personally, I've read the book and or I've read this uh, structuring and raising debt and equity for recently. I wish you would have written it sooner, Rob. There's a couple key things in here that I, if I'd have known a year or two ago, could have gotten some deals closed. And I think it's just whether this stuff interests you or not, if you're a real estate investor, it's important to to know this stuff and have the creative solutions to put deals together. Because there's always going to be times when you've got a deal here and you may just dead in the dirt and not even pursue it because you don't have the knowledge of how to structure it on the on the backside of it. So, uh, one of the one of the things that you've become known for is working with and raising institutional equity. So, talk to us a little bit about the difference when you would want to start looking to raise from institutional investors. The difference, if there is a difference between family offices and institutional equity, just that side of the house a little bit. Sure. I think when and how, well, really when is determined most by the individual's desire. Some people never want to raise institutional capital and they never have to. They can just avoid it forever. Other people want it and they want it. And if you want it, then you should start working on it now. Obviously, there's a, a bit higher of a bar. To work with private equity, if it's your first deal, that's very unlikely to be funded by institutional capital. But it's not that unrealistic that your third or fourth or fifth deal can be funded with institutional capital. So some people have this myth and idea that they need to have a 10-year track record with 10, 20 exits in order to qualify. But that's not the case. There's a lot of different firms out there when it comes to institutional capital that can write big checks. You can find firms out there that will write $25, $50 million checks even, or at least they're capable of it. And they're open to working with young sponsors that are doing their even second, third, fourth deal. So if you want it, it's out there. So that's the first idea. Not to say it's easy. It's never easy. Even if you are on your 20th deal, Finding institutional capital is really tough because they have a lot of deal flow. They're very picky and they get to be picky because they have a lot of different options to choose from. So the the best thing to do is to start working on it now if it's someone if it's someone wants it because it's all about relationships. Once you build that relationship and get the first deal done, then they have a big bias to partner with you again because they don't want to they don't work with that many partners. It's too much effort to do due diligence on a new sponsor for every deal. So they would much rather go through the heavy work to do diligence a sponsor, approve them, get a deal done. And then from there, they want to just do repeat. Everyone wants to have a repeat relationship, programmatic relationship. That's what everybody talks about. As far as the differences between family offices and institutional, it depends. It really depends because family offices are run in a very broad way. Some people, it's a very informal family office where really it's just one person who controls everything and makes decisions. And then other family offices are far more institutionalized and have an investment committee and have a deal team and also more, more red tape. So it really runs the spectrum. And private equity firms run a bit of a spectrum as well. Some will write checks as small as a million dollars. Some, their minimum check is $25 million. So you have to go out there and build relationships and find the right partners that are a fit for you based on your goals, the types of deals that you're working on and what you're looking for. And where are you, where would somebody go to find a relationship or start building a relationship with someone with this kind of money? And what are the differences between say 
building a relationship with someone like that versus somebody who you're just looking to just like a the more standard limited partner that you would the stereotypical limited partner yeah i would say that for institutional investors there's some good conferences to go to it's never perfect it's always hit or miss as far as going to an in person event but i think in person events can be very valuable if you're in the right rooms i was recently at biznow's ascent conference down in Miami. And that was my first time at that conference. And it was, it was really good. The room was great. There was a lot of re really great private equity firms to meet with. So I built a ton of relationships out of that. So I found that extremely valuable. But other times I go to conferences and I walk away and go, wow, that was a waste of time. So it's like a lot of things, it's hit or miss. But I'd say conferences are great. I would say keeping up in the news is actually a good way to find partners if you are reading the local articles or PR for your market, let's say you're focused on Houston multifamily like we are, and you're keeping up with some of the PR and the articles that are coming out and saying, hey, so-and-so sponsor just bought this deal. And they'll often name the equity partner and say the, they had a JV equity partner. So, and oh, that's interesting. So there's a, there's this JV equity partner that just closed a deal that looks exactly like the types of deals that we close. And uh, why don't I just reach out and say, Hey, I just saw you close that deal. We do deals just like that. Do you want more deal flow? What are they going to say? Of course, they're going to say yes, right? They're deal junkies. It's their job to get deal flow. So it's, it's a little bit easier if you do it right with the right confidence. And obviously you have to present yourself professionally, but don't oversell yourself. Just assume confidence. It, the doors open pretty easily. Now, the door opens pretty easily, but getting through it is a much more difficult thing, right? Usually, so it's a little bit in the reverse for retail LPs, where retail LPs, get, getting through the door, like getting the door to open is maybe a little bit harder because maybe they're a doctor and real estate's not on their mind, right? And you need to get it on their mind. But once that door's open, they are more likely to invest, right? You explain to them the benefits, they get it, and now they invest with you. And they also aren't running an investment committee and a deal team and aren't sourcing a ton of deals every week. So you show them a deal, they say, this looks pretty good and they invest. So on the flip side, institutional investors, the door opens because they want deal flow. They want to have a relationship with you, but actually getting a deal done is really tough because like I keep saying, they have to vet tons of deals and they only pick the best. So you really do have to have good deals. What are some of the benefits or when you're working with an institutional type investor, someone who's bringing a lot of money to the table? I know there's some benefits and some even some things that aren't as ideal from the operator standpoint. Talk about some of the things like why you would and why you wouldn't want to bring or work with an institutional partner. The big ones it comes down to are economics. That's probably the biggest thing because obviously there's different deals and you can negotiate, but by and large, institutional investors pay somewhere around a 1% acquisition fee and retail investors pay a 2% acquisition fee. And in some cases, more. And the same goes for the asset management fee, right? One versus two, generally speaking. We've had better deals and we've been offered worse. But if basically right off the bat, you're accepting essentially half in fees. And then the promote structure, it's not, it's not quite half on the promote side of things. But just as an example, in our syndication model, we have an 8% compounding preferred return subject to return of capital, which is actually in the syndication world, that's actually a very good preferred return because a lot of preferred returns are lower than 8%, non-compounding, and not subject to return of capital. So we have an institutional preferred return, right? Again, 8% compounding and return of capital. And then we have a 30% promote up to a 15% IRR and a 50-50 split over 15. Now, that is pretty standard, I would say, overall in the retail syndication space, but in the institutional space, the standard structure is more like a nine or 10% preferred return, again, compounding and subject to return of capital. And then like a 20% promote ish up to 12 or 13. And then above that be like a 30 and then you get to 15 and maybe you get to 15, 16, you get to get a 40 over that. And you rarely, if ever get to go 50, 50. So the promote is not as good. It's maybe like a third less favorable. So if you're getting half in fees, a third worse on the promote, that's the reality of institutional capital. So you have to decide, is it worth it to scale my business, to partner with a sophisticated investor who can bring value aside from their capital? They can bring experience, relationships, 
also they're a big fund. So if a problem happens and you need to make a capital call, they've got the money. They're not, they're big boys. They're not going to freak out. And not to say that we plan on doing capital calls or plan on things going wrong. Obviously we've never done one. We don't want to do one, but just speaking realistically, it's better if your investors are rich than poor. And I don't mean poor as in I'm being dramatic, obviously, but you get the point. So it's good. It's very nice to have investors who have millions and millions of dollars. So those are some of the pros and cons as far as, and then the other thing, which I really think is a non-event, but people make a big deal out of is control. So the standard practice is if a JV equity partners bring 80 to 90% of the equity, they're going to get major decision rights. They're going to have the right, they get to decide when you sell, refi, they get to approve major budget items on the renovations and the operation side. And so sponsors I hear sometimes not say, oh, I would never do that. I would never give up control. And I just don't understand that at all because at the end of the day, they're all the money in the deal and they're big and smart. What decision are they going to make that's going to be so contrary to you that that you find so untoward? So I really welcome giving up my decision rights because if I'm partnering with an institutional capital source, they know more than us. They have more experience than us. And at the end of the day, it's their money. I, my business is to serve them. So I have no problem with it. No, that's a great outlook. So you started talking a little bit about the numbers a little bit, and I know you're the underwriting guy. So what, with the current macro environment, with all these changes happening so rapidly, what are some of the biggest things on the underwriting side to be looking out for or some recent changes that you're making to your underwriting, some of the higher level things you're looking out for? So we're seeing expansion of cap rates, not a big one, but we're definitely seeing cap rates want to move higher. And obviously that's being driven in my opinion, solely by interest rates. Interest rates have increased a lot over the last year and that's pushing up cap rates. With that being said though, there's a lot of money out there and there's still a lot of growth and the fundamentals are really strong for multifamily. So that's keeping cap rates, that's pushing cap rates down. Interest rates are pushing cap rates up and it's a tug of war. And right now the fundamentals are winning and liquidity is winning because even though interest rates are up, there's still billions and billions of dollars that are chasing multifamily returns. That, it's a supply and demand thing. There's more capital than deals and therefore prices stay high. And that means cap rates stay low, which makes underwriting deals that much harder because if your prices are relatively the same, prices are down a little bit, but if prices are relatively the same, but your interest rates are way up and your leverage is way down, there's no way you're able to get the same returns that you were able to underwrite before. So we're struggling a lot with that. So as far as underwriting, we're not really changing much. We're sticking to our values and our process. The one thing that maybe we're sensitive to is growth assumptions. I think now is not the time to be as aggressive as before as far as growth, just because we've seen tremendous inflation and really strong rent growth. And I think that's just going to have to slow down over the coming couple of years. The economy slows down through all of this monetary tightening. I'm hearing feedback from institutional investors, for example, that if they someone sends a deal into the on their desk and the first year rent growth is 5%, they're already starting to roll their eyes and go, no, this is not working anymore. Slowing down a bit on growth. But really the conversation is all about debt. And it, as it relates to underwriting, how do we underwrite the deal with the prevailing debt available uh, and make the deal work? And it's really tough. And actually I'm coming out with an article in uh, about a week or so for our December newsletter talking about this exact thing. And in the article previously, I, I basically came out and said that it's impossible to do a new deal today. But it's impossible to do a deal today with new debt that is so unattractive today it's, and it's so tough. So loan assumptions are really one of the only games in town. With that being said, we've seen some deals and have been close on some deals that were based on new debt. So there are still opportunities out there, but it's really tough. And so one way that we've figured out a way to make sense of the market. And I need to set the stage a little bit because what is the problem in the market? The problem in the market is leverage today on permanent financing really low, like 50% low, 50% LTV that is. So simply put, if you're only getting 50% LTV, it's really hard to lever up your returns. In order to lever up your returns, you need leverage. And if you're only getting 50%, your returns are low. And also it's not a very accurate reflection of reality because the likelihood of your just signing up for a 10-year loan at 50% LTV and then sitting there forever and not relevering, it's very unrealistic. At some point, we're going to get to a point where 
rates are going to come down, leverage is going to come up, and there's going to be a better opportunity to finance. So with that being said, though, you don't want to be aggressive with your assumptions and say, hey, we're going to be able to refi in two years and everything's going to be great. Because what if we're in a recession in two years? And you don't want to go in with bridge with short-term bridge debt right now and have your loan mature somewhere in a recession. That is a risk. So bridge loans are, for more than that reason, are pretty much off the table today. If you talk to bridge lenders today, they're doing very little business right now because nobody can go to them and borrow at 8%. <laughs> It's just, how could you do a deal at 8% interest right now? So with, with that in mind, what we're looking at is borrowing long-term fixed rate debt, but underwriting a shorter hold period with the assumption that we are going to be able to access better capital markets in roughly three years time. So I don't want to give all the secrets away, but in my newsletter that I'm coming out with, I lay out the, the argument there. Oh, that's great. And yeah, I've become a recent subscriber of your newsletter and it's great. I recommend everybody listening to go check it out. But on the note of changing times and monetary tightening, I've heard a lot of debate about which ask, which asset class is the safest right now. There's the people they can't afford to buy homes, but they don't want to go into the workforce housing. So A class, oh, it's the safest. And then what about the people that are already in A class and losing their jobs and having to downsize? So what are your thoughts on some of the conversation around those things. Yeah. I also have heard a lot of arguments for both sides and I don't really know what I think. I think generally, generally the safest place to be in a downturn is class A. That's what the data generally shows. And that's true on a fundamental basis. And when I say fundamentals, the performance of the property, as well as the valuations where you see the biggest drop in performance historically generally is class C. That's where vacancies will spike, collections will drop. That's where if people are losing their jobs, they're going to be hurt the most at the lower end of the segment. And you're going to see them double up and have to be evicted, unfortunately, and go through a lot more issues than people who are renters by choice in the class A segment. And then same goes for valuations, right? When valuations are like a rubber band, where in, in good times, everything gets valued a lot valued dearly and including class C assets, they get overvalued. So they appreciate the hardest, but then they also come down the hardest because when things start going on sale, let's say we have a correction and prices come down. When prices, when things go on sale, people are going to rush to buy the good stuff, right? So the class A deal is still going to have, like, for example, right now we're seeing it right now. We were bidding, we were in a, uh, we were bidding on a new deal in one of the best parts of town, 25 offers, 25 offers in this environment. Other deals right now are getting zero offers, two offers, nothing. So it shows you that the good stuff, there's a lot of money out there and there's a lot of demand for it still. So that class A or that really demand product in the right location is not going to go down a ton in value because there's 25 bidders and they're going to keep the price high. But that really junky class C deal, that's what's going to get hit the hardest. And that's what's going to come down in value the most. So fundamentals and valuation are generally getting hit the hardest on the class C space. Uh, for some reason, some people think it's going to be a little bit different this time. I'm not really sure. So I'd probably have to stick with kind of nicer assets, better located assets will do better than the opposite. Got it. What would you say is the biggest mistake that newbie underwriters are making or make? and the biggest thing they should look out for right now with this, what we're seeing? Yeah. One, one thing I do talk about this a lot, but I think it's a good point is exit cap rates. People tend to place too much emphasis or mistakenly use their entry cap rate as the basis for their exit cap rate. And what I mean by that is if you're buying a deal at a four and a half cap, you may mistakenly assume that the market is a four and a half cap and therefore you're going to expand however you'd like to expand 10 basis points per year or 50 basis points over the hold or 100 basis points over the hold. And then that's going to be the basis for your exit cap rate. The problem is that four and a half cap that you're buying is unlikely the market cap because especially if you're buying a value add, which is the segment we're focused on. If you're buying a value add deal, you're usually buying a compressed cap rate that does not reflect the market cap rate. So in reality, if you're going to buy a deal that's, let's say, has a little bit above market vacancy, and it has $200 below market rents. You're going to pay a cap rate premium in order to be able to have that value add upside. So actually the market is a five cap, but you're paying a four and a half cap for all this 
potential upside. So what you actually need to do is assess that, the, okay, the cap in the market is a five and I'm going to expand by 50 basis points over the market. So my exit cap rate should be five and a half. So some people may, without really realizing it, use too low of an exit cap rate on their projections because they're going in at a low cap. So you need to make that adjustment. So right now this that's always important, but right now it's especially important just because cap rates are really all over the place. So that's one thing. The other thing too, I don't know if it necessarily is unique to this environment. Rent comps are so big and they're overlooked because they're hard work. It takes a lot of time to really analyze other properties, look at the condition of them, understand what they're offering, and then compare them based on the floor plans and the square footage, as well as the amenities and the condition uh, and the location. So it's really a lot of work to drill down into rent comps. Got it. So Rob, I know you're an extremely humble guy, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to just give us your, not your underwriting secret sauce or any secrets that you have out there, but the Rob Beardsley secret sauce, what's your secret? What do you think you've done differently than others to achieve such a, to achieve success at such a young age? How have you gotten there? What have you been doing? I've been quite intentional. So I've been... For now, I think six years or so have been journaling nearly every day and writing down my goals every day. There's a statistic out there, something like just writing your goals down makes it 25% more likely to happen. So being intentional with what do I actually want to accomplish and then spending my efforts on that because too often, too many people, we all go through our day and we do emails and we get a bunch done, but then we didn't really do anything <laughs> or anything that really moved us forward in a big way towards our goals. And so that is something really important to actually be putting yourself in a position to spend time on things that further yourself. And so that's always been something really important to me. The other thing too, is I think fake it till you make it. When I was starting out, I was young, inexperienced, but I was still willing to pick up the phone and I was still willing to talk to brokers, get deal flow, bid on deals. We were bidding on deals before we had any idea on how we'd even close it. And then when we got our first deal under contract, we still didn't have any idea how we would close it. And we honestly didn't. We had no idea what was in store for us. And we learned on the go and we made mistakes and we learned so many lessons. And sure, it would have been really nice to know those lessons before diving in, but how would we how would, you know, how would we learn them otherwise? So there's no better time than just to do it now and make it happen. So that kind of this confidence in just jumping into the deep end and figuring out how to swim, I think has served us well and has been a reinforcing loop where you take a risk and you get the reward. And then now it builds your confidence that, okay, I know that I can take leaps of faith and things are going to work out. I think that will continue to serve us well as we look to grow the business and go into things and go into territory that we've never been in before. Got it. So you mentioned journaling. Do you have a like a daily routine or any other key habits that you do on a daily basis that have helped you get to where you are? There's a few things and they're kind of like I meditate in the morning, right? And I'm, but at the same time, I don't really think that it's a huge key to my success. I don't know, maybe it isn't. I, so I'm not going to sell that. But what I do think is really critical, and this goes back to the first point about actually being intentional and doing things that take you further is when, I don't do this every day, but when I really need to, I will essentially block off deep work on my calendar. And so I definitely recommend everybody to read the word, to read the book, Deep Work by Cal Newport. And the concept is really simple. Basically sit there and work, right? And don't get distracted and then do that a lot. But for a lot of us and me included, I need to read a 400 page book about not getting distracted and deep working to have it sink in. For example, when I wrote my most recent book, I was, I procrastinated it for so long. I literally procrastinated the book for a year. I started writing it. And then I just got busy and said, ah, you know what? I just won't write it for now. And I kicked the can, kicked the can. And then you kick the can so long that it's grown into a monster, right? You're so behind that you feel like you need to sit down and write 10,000 words or you're a failure. And so I snapped out of it and I just told myself, okay, you're going to sit here for two hours, block it off, turn off your phone. I don't care how many words I write. doesn't matter. doesn't matter how many words I write. The, what matters and I'm going to give myself a big pat on the back if I just sit here for two hours in, in front of the computer with Word up. And that was it. And I, I started doing that every day, every morning. And of course, I'm not just going to sit there nothing. So I start writing and it clicks and I put one foot together. And then 
you start to feel good about your progress and then you actually want to sit down and write more and you make it happen. Yeah. Like I said, I don't do it every morning or every day, but when I need to get something done, just blocking it off and having that uninterrupted focus is, is definitely really helpful. Yeah. Cal, Cal Newport's got some other good ones as well. And I read deep work and like you, it was eye opening. It's funny to think that you got to read a book to realize this stuff. So many distractions out there today. And if you're not intentional, like you've been saying, it's so easy to just let the whole day go by and not actually accomplish anything meaningful. And I can definitely relate with the uh, that monster building up. Same thing with this podcast. I think January of 2020 is when I said, I, I also journal, I was reading back through it. And January was when I said, okay, I'm going to have this thing going by April of this year. April of 2021 was when it actually got started. Definitely important to just put one step in one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. Rob, what are, what's your goals for Lone Star in 2023? For 2023, we're in store for an interesting market. I think it's going to be a real slow first half of the year. So our original goal was to do 350 million in acquisition volume for 2023. But obviously, we're not going to force it. That's a very market-dependent goal. So I would be very happy with 250 million in 2023. So 250 to 350 million in acquisition volume is a goal of ours. We would also we're also working hard to launch a development strategy. And so doing right now, we're working on all the things necessary to get into that business. And hopefully in 2023, we can start our first development deal. So yeah, those are really the major goals. Also. Starting January 1st, 2023, we are rolling out some new construction management initiatives. So for further along the road of bring construction in-house and then hoping to make a few key hires as well. Got it. All right, Rob, time for one more question. So I work at a nuclear power plant on the central coast of California. It's currently set to shut down in the next couple of years. So my mission is to replace my W-2 income with income from real estate investing. So what is your one piece of advice you would offer to folks who are in my position or a similar position looking to create a life of or freedom and control via investing or entrepreneurship? Uh, raising capital is the most valuable skill in the world. So spending your efforts on that is the best use of your time. Got it. Rob, where can people reach you if they want to connect or learn more about what you got going on? We didn't talk too much about the specifics on the new book, but would love to shout out the new book and uh, let people know that they can go to structuringandraising.com to check out the new book. If you want to just learn more about Lone Star Capital and myself, generally, you can head over to our website, lscre.com. On our website, we've got some free giveaways like the underwriting model that I built from scratch that we use every day to underwrite lots of deals. So we give that away for free on our website and you can find our articles and sign up for the newsletter and so on. And if you want to get in touch, you can do that there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Can't recommend the new book enough. It, Like I said, I wish he had written it sooner. It would have helped me close a couple of deals in the past couple of years. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Beardsley of Lone Star Capital. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for listening to Freedom Investor Radio. If you like what you heard, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks again for listening.